There are things that crawl and things that fly and things that creep around in the dark, slithering beasties in our lakes and oceans and monsters of every shape, size, and in every culture. The pursuit of these beings falls under the header of cryptozoology. But what if legends of shapeshifters, vampires, werewolves, and skinwalkers are true and that they move amongst us? Today, we explore this topic with a look at an encounter with the Beast of Bray Road, a werewolf dogman-like creature, the vampire of mineral wells, a creature so bizarre and creepy that among its eyewitnesses are the police, lake monsters, and the strange mass sightings of a huge bat-like or mothman creature terrorizing the skies over Chicago. Stay tuned as we discuss these topics with our guests, Eric Mintel, Mike Huberty, and Jack Chavez on the best in paranormal programming. This is the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. First up tonight is a friend of ours, an acclaimed jazz pianist and band leader of the Eric Mintel Quartet and lead paranormal investigator for Eric Mintel Investigates TV show, formerly known as Bucks County Paranormal Investigates. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome to the program this evening, Eric Mintel. Hello, Eric. Dave, how are you? I'm doing great, and I'm doing even better now that you're here with us. And I know you've been reaching out. We've been playing a tag, trying to make this thing happen. You have had a very strange encounter, well, multiple encounters, while seeking the legend of the Beast of Bray Road. For our listeners that may have been living in a cave and and are not familiar with this case, can you give us a brief summation of the Beast of Bray Road? Yeah, absolutely. And I had heard of it over the years myself. And uh, But the Beast of Bray Road is supposed to be an upright canine, uh, werewolf-like creature, uh, bipedal, uh, walking on two legs very, very fast, very fast. Uh, Also has a walk that has a very strange gait. Uh, to the walk, but also uh, very like luminous red glowing eyes. That's also been the, uh, the reports. So, you know, this creature has been sighted in that area. I mean, going as far back as the mid thirties and uh, our research has kind of led us to believe that there is more than, obviously there's more than one. There's like a family or a pack uh, of these creatures there. Okay. Now you hear a story like this. It's in Wisconsin, right? Rural Wisconsin. Yeah. This isn't some faraway land like England or Ireland or Scotland where there are all of these unbroached areas where wilderness still reigns. This is in rural Wisconsin. And when you first heard about this, how much stock did you give in the concept that maybe there really is something there? Well, when I when I first heard about this, and when I have to go back and just say that the reason why this whole investigation came to be was because one of our friends and fans who is now, I made her the executive producer of the video, Ellen Collins, she's really the one that, that got us out there, uh, wanted to do the story. She approached me and said, you know, we should do a story on the Beast of Bray Road. And like most people, I had heard of the story. I've heard of this creature, but I didn't really know the backstory too much. So we get out there and, you know, I I was looking at, we're going to go out there and we're going to have this great story. We're going to do a great video. We're going to do a great documentary on this creature, not Mm -hmm. knowing that we'd actually encounter this thing the night of October 3rd last year. All right. Time is going to go fast on us. I've got three guests. You're each in for about 20 minutes. So October 3rd, you decide to set out and go in search of the Beast of Bray Road. You sent me two video clips that are pretty bizarre. Tell me about this first clip and how long into the investigation were you when you saw 
something in the skies well we were on the farm of lee hample now lee is a phenomenal uh, gr guy and has had so many sightings thousands of pictures thousands of videos of of this creature um so we went out on lee's farm he gave us full access to the farm uh and we got out there and i had earlier in the day i had baited this area with steak bones that we had the night before so okay. with that being said uh the night we get out there within five minutes this is what happened. Dominic Sattel, our team member, uh, looked up. It had been cloudy, but we get out to the field and it completely cleared up. It was a clear sky. And all of a sudden he looks up and says, what the hell is that? And this is what uh, what we saw. What the hell is that, Eric? What, that up there? Yeah, really. Is that a plane? I don't know. No, it's not a plane because it's, you would be able to see it. It would be flashing. Out. I think we got moving. something, Scott. Check Too that fast. out. Can you get up there at all? I mean, I hear it. It sounds like it, but... No, it's moving too fast and it's getting closer. Can you hear it? Can you see that? I think you got it. The red dot. Because yeah. this over here is a plane. Well, look at That's flashing over there. See? This is flashing. Yeah, that's and a that, plane. Yeah, There's no, that, no that, flashing that's lights. Flashing what the over. hell is that? Okay, so that's flashing. That's flashing over there. Red. But this one is not. This one is not. This is a solid... Fat, that's a fat. plane. That's a plane. There's a plane over here. That is just solid light going moving. away from us. Well, actually, it was getting brighter. Holy moly. Now it's that's gone. really gone. Well, look at that. Yeah. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. So, so are there a lot of claims of unidentified flying objects and yeah. the Beast of Bray Road? Absolutely. You know, this is something that, we, you know, as we were there and as this investigation was progressing, UFO sightings are very prevalent. Uh, Lee has pictures of orbs in the field. He's got videos of these weird lights going through the woods, uh, which couldn't be vehicles because we've been in those woods and they're so thick. There's no way you could get anything dr driving through the woods. It was like just lights going through the woods. Um, yeah, so that was one of the things that was, and you could see other planes on that video. It's hard to see, but in the actual video, I encourage people to go check that out. It's called the Beast of Bray Road, Alive and Well. And you could see the planes. You could see other planes in the air. This was just a solid white orb of light. And it just did it like a 45 and disappeared. And I was so glad. That, and that was one thing. We had a trifecta of paranormal activity that night within like 10 minutes. All right. So trifecta. You've got this strange light over the skies. Uh, I know that you... Well, let, let's just go. Where, what, what was the second part of this trifecta? So right after the right after the UFO, we heard, and you'll hear, and I'll, you could play the whole clip there, but we heard a, ho a howl. The third howl that we heard on this thing was was like, a, I mean, it was just very startling. And let's talk about that when we come back. You could. This is what happened to us right after we saw the UFO. <laughs> Are you hearing this howl? I am hearing this howl. It's coming from over that way. Oh shit. Fuck. Uh oh. That's getting closer. So this was not a coyote. It's not a wolf. It's not a dog. It's it's not a wolf. It's not, you know, nothing like not a fox. And we're still trying to figure out what could that be. Now, people, I had a witness that I had talked to. And he was a state worker and uh, and he couldn't have his face shown in the video, but he was basically describing the same thing that we just heard him and a coworker got out of the got out of their truck and he heard this low guttural like howl that just kept going. And he said it was like a, a scream and a growl combined, but this was more like a yell. This to me, it sounded like a man screaming in the field and it was the spookiest thing that we ever heard. The third thing I didn't uh, send you, though, was right after that, this weird mist started coming up from the field. Now, mist has been also now associated with Bigfoot sightings. Really? Okay. This is a new thing now. All of a sudden, we're getting uh, Stan Gordon. I'm sure you're familiar with Stan. Right, sure. he's, uh, he's got a lot of witnesses that are also reporting this weird mist that happens, you know, accompanying Bigfoot sightings. But 
This other thing that happened to us as well was we were getting these weird electronic disturbances there. Uh, earlier in the day, Scott, our drone operator, he did a really nice drone sweep of the entire field. And we were in the field. Lee took us down to the area, to this bait area where he's had all the activity. Scott had uh, virtual reality glasses on and he's got a very high tech drone and we're going over the field. We literally disappeared on his screen in this one section of the field. Mm -hmm. So when I said to Lee, I said, Lee, do you think this could be a portal? And he's like, absolutely. So he, I mean, he's got pictures of portals. He's got, I mean, Dave, when I tell you that there's these strange, strange pictures that are unexplainable, it's, it, this is a mystery that just keeps getting deeper and deeper. And again, like I said, at first I thought we were going to do this great video, but it's, it was just amazing the footage that we got and just within like a half hour. Um, but we kept hearing rustling sounds going on behind us after that howl. So that wasn't, it just didn't end there. We kept hearing all of this rustling. There was no wind. It was dead calm, but we heard all this movement. And I personally just said, look, you know, we have nothing to protect ourselves. We only had a flashlight and a radio, you know, and that's, that's not going to protect us. Um, so I said to the guys, I said, look, Ellen and, and Dominic, I said, you know, your safety is more important than anything. So I think we need to get the hell out of here because to me, it was telling us get out of here. This is my territory. And other researchers have had that similar, uh, you know, similar feeling. Right. Um, but yeah, very, very strange. Now, is this, is this creature known to attack? Has it attacked animals? Has it attacked people? Lee, here's the other thing. Lee's got trail cam pictures of some weird mist, right? That comes in the, even in the middle of the daytime, but he had a, a raccoon that he threw down in the tall grass. Okay. So he puts, put it down there in this bait area, putting it down in the tall grass. Now the tall grass was not disturbed. Nothing was disturbed around this grass. Okay. About a week later, the, he goes in and looks and the raccoon is split open. Like just something split it open. None of the grasses is, is disturbed. He comes back about a couple of days later. Now the raccoon is out of that area. Again, the grass is not disturbed and it's 15 feet in a little pile away from where he originally put it. So what is doing this? Something's got to be picked. There's, and there's no way birds could get in there because there's trees there. There's like, if you well, get the splitting, I think is natural in some animals as the gases build in a cadaver, the skin is known to split. And sometimes people think it's with surgical precision, but you're saying that something then lifted it up from there and ate it in another area. Right. Okay. So he's, he's had a bunch of these strange encounters. I know that um, Linda Godfrey has been a, a longtime friend of ours is a big researcher into this. Uh, she also told me a few years ago while researching, she had an encounter with a light ball mm -hmm. that came up to her and they could see this thing moving around as you were explaining this ghost light kind of phenomena moving through the woods as well. So this guy's got kind of the, as you said, the trifecta of activity, UFOs, ghostly balls of light, creatures that are in that area. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. I mean, and here Lee is a retired math teacher. So, you know, he, he had no interest in the paranormal whatsoever when he bought his farm. It was only when his neighbor said, oh, yeah, by the way, did you know the creature lives on your farm? Because he, he bought it from his mother's estate because he wanted, he wanted to be a hay farmer. So he was, he was a teacher for 35 years. And now he's looking at this very, very scientifically. He's got such pure data. Also, he's got incredible hair samples that he found in the field that under the microscope, they're translucent. There's no medulla. And it's like, is this thing, could this thing be cloaking itself somehow? That was the other idea. Because he, all of the stuff that he's got, the trail cams aren't picking it up. Hmm. They may be picking up a little blur or something. And the weird thing, here's another thing real quick. The night of our investigation, the trail cam, Lee went down the next day. The trail cam shut off at five o'clock that night. And it didn't take another picture until seven o'clock the next morning. So there's no pictures of us down there. Uh, and again, this electronic disturbance is Scott's GoPro. He had it set up on the bait because we were just going, we wanted to get something that was going to come toward that, toward the stake bones. He got nothing. 
it couldn't hook up, couldn't record. And then the power in Elkhorn went out completely that night. So the, this was this was a very, very strange, strange thing. And I, I in my hotel room, I brought back, I had must have had a stick on my uh on my shoe. And Dominic goes, You brought it back with you, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, for people that are out there listening and they're like, this sounds ludicrous. I want to show you an image. This was taken recently from a camera at a zoo taking a picture outside of the zoo's perimeter fence. This image of what looks to be a bipedal walking wolf-like creature. We're still waiting to know more about this, see if the footage will actually be released. Um, a lot of people are debating over what this is. Some say it looks like a true skinwalker in the sense that the Native Americans would often wear these pelts and take on the guise of um, whatever creature that they felt you know, inhabited them. Mm. This does almost look like a costumey wolf figure, but it's it's kind of got that strange gait, like you mentioned yeah. about the Beast of Bray Road. I want to know more about this. We're going to keep looking into it, but there are many different encounters that are popping up that have this kind of what the <laughs> right sense to it that, that yeah. it's just that this makes no sense. Well, now, people that want to see the full episode, Eric. Where do they find the full episode of, of your uh, documentary? Thank you, Dave. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's on uh, Eric Nintel Investigates, our, our YouTube channel. And they can find it. It's the first video. It's uh, The Beast of Bray Road, Alive and Well. And, and I'll tell you what, folks, because I love you, right below on today's program guide, you're going to find that exact link. So now you can go watch the full episode in its entirety in foul language and all. <laughs> dirty, but, dirty Dave, I, I, gotta, I know we have a couple of minutes left, but I got to tell you, mm -hmm. we, did, we just did, we just did a follow-up investigation in April. Okay. We were back out in Elkhorn, April 28th through May 1st. We went and uh, we had a town hall meeting on April 28th. Over 140 people showed up to tell their story of, of seeing this thing. So this is a this is a phenomena out there that is that's going on that people are seeing, and what really got me on this particular uh, follow up was the the account of how this thing walks. This is this and how fast it is because that's one when Lee had his encounter, he said it moved so fast and jumped like almost fifty feet in the air, um, and then another person saw it going down Bray Road. Saw and saw the seven foot tall thing walking, running on two legs. So that was really interesting. Um, and then this particular, and I'm editing that video right now. So that's going to be, uh, that'll be released pretty soon. But uh, we've got some really, really great things in this particular video. Now, you said he's got a lot of interesting photographs and video evidence. Uh, do you share any of that in your documentaries? We do. Or are these out on the internet people can find as well? Well, let's put it this way he's keeping a lot of those close to the vest because. Okay. There are some really in incredible pictures there that we really have to kind of, he wants to hold them and I, and it's uh, rightly so because there are some really great stuff, but there is a lot of video in this, in that Beast of Bray Road Alive and Well uh, uh, video that we just did. You'll see the UFOs going through the trees, the strange orbs, the hair samples. So we put that all in our, in our videos. We have just one minute left together, Eric. I need to know. What was your plan? I like to ask this of all people that go out in search of these beasts. What was your plan if you found it? You know, at least to document it and we would get... Wait, no, 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 no. Eric. <laughs> Eric, if it's a giant beast-like wolf man out in the woods, I mean, did you bring a gun? Did you bring a baseball bat? Did you bring Will Smith to at least slap the crap out of it if it got out of control? Unfor you know, I should have. I should have done right. it. No, yeah. you know, Dave, again... I mean, I'm just going with the fact that I thought we would hear this great story. I didn't think that we'd actually encounter this thing. That's how naive I was at that at that juncture. Being a being an investigator, I should have been more prepared. But I <laughs> yeah, think, yeah, thinking that we would just hear a story, right? Right. Um, but yeah. It, so next time, next time, and this time around, we were a little bit more prepared as well. But uh, but yeah, it was very very frightening. All right, Eric, thank you so much for stopping by, sharing your video clips with us. I will have a link, as I said, for your video in Thanks, tonight's Dave. program guide that they can check out as well. Always a pleasure catching up with you, Eric. Thank you, Dave. You too, man. Thank you so much.
You got it. Let's do this. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, a good friend of ours, Mike Huberty, will join us and we'll talk about uh, a vampire sighting that is well documented, not once, but multiple times over the years. And not just by some drunk hillbilly in the backwoods of some little area, but even the police have had eyewitness encounters in uh, Mineral Point with this vampire-like being. Is that even possible? I'm, I'm not sure. Stay tuned. We'll find out more about that. Haunted Magazine, issue 34, is out June 7th, featuring exclusive interviews by Chris Fleming and Gail Porter about their new show, Spooked Scotland. Richard Estep investigates the Sally House. Sam Baltrusis shares a personal story about Salem. Kate Ray explores the gnomes of Woolerton Hall. The origins of Dracula by Neil Storey. And there's much, much more. Order in print from the Haunted Magazine website or visit WH Smith in the UK, Barnes & Noble in the US and outlets in Canada, Australia and New Zealand. Also available in app stores. And remember, don't be normal, be paranormal. Join us at a paranormal convention like no other. Admission is only $20 in Woodbridge, New Jersey for the 8th Annual New Jersey Para-Unity Expo. Woodbridge, New Jersey, July 23rd. Only $20 to see stars like The Ghost Hunters, Jason Hawes, Sherry D. Benedetti, Steve Gonzalez, and Dave Tango. We also have Amy Allen from TV's Dead Files, Jawan Mass, Dalen Spratt and Marcus Harvey. The Ghost Brothers are back in the house. Dakota Layden, Chelsea Layden, Tanner Wiseman, and Alex Schrader from Destination Fear make their appearance. You'll also get to meet and see Chip Coffee with a live gallery. Dave Schrader from The Holzer Files and The Paranormal 60. Cody and Satori Hawes, the paranormal couple. John Zappas, the legend himself, will be on hand. You do not want to miss this. Plus, there's awesome vendors, psychics, mediumship readings, and more. Go to NewJerseyParaUnityExpo.com for tickets and information. That's www.NewJerseyParaUnityExpo.com. I'm Cliff Berrickman, and I've found Bigfoot and beyond at the Oregon Bigfoot Festival and beyond at the Clackamas County Fairgrounds. Meet me and other cryptozoology experts like Jason Hawes of Ghost Hunters, psychic medium Sarah Lemos, Travel Channel's David Schrader, and more. Don't miss this one-day event, the Oregon Bigfoot Festival and beyond at the Clackamas County Fairgrounds. Get tickets today. The Oregon Bigfoot Festival, come on, come on. We are back. Thank you so much for being here with us as we explore strange creatures today. Joining us now, a friend of ours, a paranormal researcher, rock and roller, supernatural tour specialist, Mike Huberty. He has been at many of the different paranormal conventions that we've been a part of and always brings the fun. Mike, look, at you've got the nice sunny backdrop of your screen. I've got the creepy, edgy night of ours. We've come together. Northern night, southern sun. We've got it going. Right. That, that's right. It's uh, it's it's bringing the Midwest connection together, Dave, and I hope you're well. And uh, thank you for the very um, <clears throat> exaggerated introduction. I like to think I'm fun, <laughs> but I don't know how my, how true that is. But I'll do my best. Uh, anybody, that, anybody that's met you at Michigan Paracon or any number of the conventions you've been a part of knows how fun you are and informative. Um, listen, man, 
there are a lot of strange encounters that are going on out there. These strange yes. creature encounters. And I'm wondering, um, in, in sharing this first story with us, and we've got a couple other little things we'll, we'll talk about, but I want to know about this vampire and, and how did this myth and legend begin? Where, where, where did this start? Well, let's, um, what I want to do is start with a little history of the area. Uh, in Wisconsin, the uh, southwestern part of the state is known as the driftless region. And so it's driftless because uh, during the last ice age, the glacier never came over it and iced over that particular part of the state. So the um, geography is a little bit different in this region. It's a little more hilly. It's... Um, it's still very, you know, rural and beautiful and, and the pastoral ideal and everything. But uh, the, the driftless region is its own particular um, kind of has a, its own geography to itself. Okay. And also because of, um, you know, it's kind of interesting geography, it had a ton of lead mines there. Um, and that's what drew a lot of settlers in the early part of the 19th century. So um, this area is really settled between like 1830 and 1850. You've got miners coming at the rate of 10,000 a year. It, 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 it's a big deal at the time. Now we're like, oh, yeah. 10,000 a year. That's But at the time, this is a big deal. Everybody's coming out. Um, miners are coming. A lot of Welsh, a lot of people from Cornwall. And this is before the great like mining gold rush in California. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where they first came um, in when they came to the U.S. They came to this area uh, to mine and make their fortunes doing it because they were already miners over in Cornwall and Wales. And they brought their expertise um, and maybe some of their legends uh, over to uh, the United States when they came. And so a couple of cities in this driftless region um, there's Ridgeway, there's Mineral Point, there's Dodgeville. They're all kind of small, close together, you know, all a few miles apart from each other. And um, they had this road, the old military trail that went through and it, it touched on all of these cities. And it seems that like Bray Road, like you guys were talking about, it seems that along this trail, people were seeing weird things back then. And they're seeing weird things even now. So let's go. This is uh, the Wisconsin State Journal, um, 2nd of April, 1981. The headline, Vampire Stalk Mineral Point. Count Dracula has arrived in this small former lead mining community. For the past several nights, police here have been plagued with reports of vampires jumping out of the shadows around the downtown area, scaring people. It all started on Monday night when police officer John Pepper encountered a strange looking person in the cemetery, said police Lieutenant Bill Troll. According to the Pep Pe <clears throat> excuse me, according to Pepper's report, he was routinely shining his light through the Graceland Cemetery when it flashed on a huge person with a white painted face and wearing a dark cape. Pepper ran after the stranger and lost him. He later described him fleeing vampire as being six foot three and ugly. Trot continues, this is his quotes, this is a newspaper. Last night, we had a half dozen vampires on the loose in town. We received several phone calls and were stopped by people on the street reporting encounters with white-faced, creepy-looking people jumping out of the shadows at them. While Trot and several Iowa County Sheriff's officers chased vampires around town, they were unable to catch any. Trot blamed the rash of vampires Tuesday night on pranksters who heard of Pepper's Monday night encounter. We will probably have vampires around here for the next two weeks now that they think they can get away with it and scare a few people, he said. He said they've had problems with vandalism in the past in the cemetery. And he uh, it also finishes up with Trot swears his report is not an April Fool's joke. OK, mm. says this. It gets picked up all over the country, like because it hits the wire service. Vampires right. in Mineral Point, Wisconsin gets picked up. Boston Herald's got an article about it. They their commentary was like, sure, having fun in Wisconsin on April Fool's. Um, and, you know, part of the report, though, of Pepper is that this vampire wasn't just this character in a dark cape, but he could jump uh, long distances and get away. And this is in. Um, our friend Chad Lewis, who's just a, he lives a couple miles away from me in his Wisconsin uh, Road Guide to Haunted Locations, when he talks about um, the Mineral Point vampire, he went out to Mineral Point to try to talk to the people who might have known him. And he said, um, 
that uh, they weren't able to contact him because he moved away. But the people who knew uh, John Pepper in Merrill Point, they thought of him as a practical joker. They told the story that John and a friend would often dress up as an ape and run around town. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's that John Pepper is a ridiculous character and, and all those kind of things. But that's not um, the last weird sighting. This is long after John Pepper moved away. This is from a Facebook group called Wisconsin Death Trip Discussions. Oh, um, it's a nice, happy sounding uh, right. Wisconsin travel Death, guide. Yeah, Wisconsin Death Trip was the name of a book um, about Black River Falls, Wisconsin, which was another mining town that when the mines dried up, a lot of horror, like a lot of horrible things happened to the people. And, um, that's, uh, and, and so, uh, that Wisconsin death trip was, is, is based on a discussion based on a book, but this is a poster talking about, um, what he had heard March 14th, 2008, around 9 PM mineral point police respond to a number of calls of a person sitting in a tree outside an apartment complex and leaping upon those who passed by the person described matched that of the mineral point vampire. As police arrived, the suspect jumped from the tree and ran off into the night. Authorities followed what they believed to be his tracks in the snow, which led to a 10-foot high cement wall and stopped. The suspect could not be found. Um, that's Derek. And he even has another story um, in July of 2008 about two... Well, no, Mike, people. I've got to ask you. When, yes. you. when you see these kind of accounts, obviously we've been around the block a few times. We yes. know legend and lore. We know. But when you start hearing this and then people are following footsteps up to a 10-foot wall that just <laughs> stop, does it make you ever stand back and go, hmm, this is weird? Because, listen, a lot of the legend of the Strigoi and the vampire come from Europe, right? And this right. was settled by a lot of Europeans uh, to, to try to mine this area. Could well, that's... One of them have That's, brought this the connection them. is um is is something was in the uh early 19th century in england they had this character called spring-heeled jack right and so spring-heeled jack is um let me uh pull up a description of him but the way they you know he's like he looks like the devil a classical image of the devil sometimes he's hairy got a big goatee beard this is from the bbc pointed ears and horns and flashing fiery eyes uh they had illustrations of him in popular magazines called penny dreadfuls and they say he kind of looks like a what we think of maybe a hispanic version of the devil um the one feature that never varied was his ability to jump to leap over rooftops and across hedges such agility always allowed him to terrify his victims and then to escape his pursuers a bounder indeed now this spring hill jack character is really popular in uh the 1830s over mm -hmm. in the uk now the 1830s is where uh all these cornish and welsh settlers are now coming over to this area now it's not mm -hmm. specifically mineral point where the first um sightings or reports of something happens but it's the nearby town of ridgeway and so starting in the 1840s people start having um and this is this is just a couple miles i mean not a couple like you know like between like 10 miles away from mineral point it's people coming through going to mineral point mineral point it's it's a mining town. They're all settled by the same kind of people. They're all in communication with with each other. There's thousands of miners that have come to Wisconsin to get rich. And they're in communication with their family back in the UK. A lot of people are coming over. They hear the Spring Heel Jack stories. And then they come on over uh, to the US and uh, specifically the Driftless region. And so the Ridgeway Phantom is... What I think, I think he's related, at least you know, in a spiritual way, to the mineral like point a third, vampire, third cousin or something. Sure, <laughs> right? Because the Ridgeway Phantom, much like Spring Hill Jack, is a is a trickster, uh, likes to scare people, likes to mess with people, just like you know the mineral point vampire. And um, you know, the mineral point vampire isn't attacking anybody; he's jumping around. He's you know, scaring people through the town of Mineral Point. He's uh, creeping along. He's an introverted uh, monster. He wants <laughs> right. you to be scared, but he's too afraid to actually make physical contact. I got you. Well, Graceland Cemetery kind of made the news early this year, too, in Mineral Point, because that's where uh, Betty White's husband is buried. Oh, okay. Alan Ludden right. um, is from Mineral Point, Wisconsin. And so they were wondering, because he was the host of Password in the 70s. He's like, right. a, you know... 
um, a John Davidson type character or whatever. And so Betty White, you know, she was her only husband. And after he died, she said, you know, I'm never going to get married again. Why, why try the rest when I've already had the best, I think was her quote oh, about right. Alan yeah. Ludden. And, um, and so his, his grave is in there and they were wondering if she might be, now she's not going to be, but they were wondering if, if she might be buried uh, in Mineral Point, Wisconsin as well, in this mm. Graceland Cemetery where they saw the Mineral Point vampire. And then, um, interestingly enough, the, the last sighting of the Mineral Point vampire happens at um, a place named after Alan Ludden's family, Ludden Lake. And that's in 2008, Brandon Hines and his girlfriend, Jamie Marker, uh, fishing off the jetty on the far west shore of Ludden Lake when the couple heard noises coming from under it. Noises were described as sounding like something was using the boards of the jetty like a ladder climbing along underneath us. Hines began stomping the boards, believing it was some kind of animal and hoping to scare it away. He aimed his flashlight between the cracks of the boards when he and, Marger, he and Marker heard water splashing down towards the other side of the jetty. Heinz shone his flashlight towards the sound to see a, quote, a figure with dark hair and a very pale face pulling itself up out of the jetty. Heinz and Marker stood in shock as the figure began to rise to its feet. Marker turned and ran up the path toward Heinz's vehicle as Heinz kept the flashlight aimed. Heinz says it was wearing some kind of Dracula-looking cape and a suit, sort of. Heinz threw his flashlight towards the figure and ran up the path. And uh, then they ran off. Now, it says here in the story, the couple drove the Mineral, Mineral Point Police Department and made a statement directly after. Mm -hmm. um, a patrol unit in the area of Ludden Lake investigated, but found no one. Um, and, you know, these last you know, two stories, the 2004 and the 2008 sightings, those are both from Facebook. And I wasn't able to find the newspaper articles. Um corroborating the you the corroborate history. like like the original mineral point vampire sure. story in 1981 you just look it up and you can find the clippings of the papers it came from um but either way you can see how that's kind of in the lore and mm -hmm. with ridgeway the town over um that has the phantom um there's hundreds of stories of the ridgeway ridgeway phantom from the second half of the 19th century and it's almost when you look up on newspapers.com you look up ridgeway basically all you find are stories about the phantom wow. because they keep on doing um you know because a lot of times uh ridgeway historical society and stuff they'll come in and they'll do specific stories when halloween time and everything that always makes the madison newspaper when that happens but um you can find a collection of of a lot of the stories um online and it's you know it's basically let me find it's a charles e brown was this um he was the an archaeologist. Charlie Brown. Do, 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 do. Charlie <laughs> right. Brown. It'd be a, it'd be more fun if it was Charlie Brown and he had the little hair and the thing right. And, right. Well, Lucy didn't kick this guy's football. Um, <laughs> Char Charles E. Brown. He was uh, like one of the first directors of the Wisconsin Historical Society, and during the. Um, uh, Great Depression, when they, you know, had to create jobs for people and they had the Works Progress Administration, you know, to make jobs, he right. took on collecting all the folklore of Wisconsin. So a lot of the settler folklore, ghost stories, um, Indian stories, a lot have been saved because of his work. So if you hear a ghost story from Wisconsin that's before like 1940, chances are Charles E. Brown was the guy. Um, that found the story, but he's collecting these stories about the Ridgeway ghost. And he, and he puts out like a pamphlet in the 1940s and um, two, two things. Um, number one, this ghost is a trickster along old military road where there's also a lot of uh, saloons for the miners. Mm -hmm. So old military roads got a lot of saloons and the kind of stories like the, the, um, the Ridgeway ghost would steal your horse. The Ridge, you know, the Ridgeway ghost um, would put your saddle on backwards. Right. It's sure, all, right. right. A lot of schwelling going on and uh, drinking. Yes. It, it's all things like that. And then you get stuff that's just a little more questionable than that. When, when you're wondering now, the, <laughs> More questionable than something stealing your horse and putting your uh, saddle on backwards? Well, yeah, because um, according to the New York Times in 1902, who was doing a story on uh, Wis the ghosts of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. um, December 7th, 1902, they, they collect a story where they say the Ridgeway ghost killed somebody. Ooh. And in the paper, they say, um, 
John Lewis, a prosperous farmer living in the vicinity of Ridgeway, a man of sober life, okay, so he's not going to the saloons, and undaunted courage, cut through the fields one night after helping a neighbor with some butchering. Climbing a stone wall, his attention was arrested by the sight of a figure that seemed to have gathered itself together out of the just now tenantless air and stood confronting him in a menacing attitude. Lewis fled, but the ghost stepped across his path and raised its arm. Next morning, a neighbor found Lewis lying inside the wall in a semi-conscious condition. He said he had been hurled in the air as if in the vortex of a cyclone, pounded, crushed into insensibility. He died a few hours after he was carried home, asserting with his dying breath that he had come to his end by a supernatural agency. We need more newspaper uh, right. journalists that write like that, man. I would read the newspaper if, if there was that kind of colorful descriptions and writings again. Right. That's the paper of record. That's awesome. Um, and, and then uh, I think also Charles collected one more death um, associated with the Ridgeway Phantom. And uh, that comes uh, in 1933. And he says, okay. Lewis Meyer, the sexton of the Catholic cemetery at Ridgeway, did not return at home at night. The next day, his body was found hanging in a tool shed. For a year, he had been in poor health. Afterward, there was whispered talk that Meyer probably had some disagreement with the Ridgeway ghost, and the ghost itself had hung him. Ooh. So um, different things in Ridgeway over the years have been blamed on the ghost. There's shape-shifting. There's the trickery. Um, there's the running around cemeteries. And you guys were talking about Linda Godfrey a second ago. Right, right. And uh, right, I mean Linda's makes Wisconsin uh so proud and we love her. And um she wrote this great book that I recommend to everybody called Hunting the American Werewolf. And right. that's where she really goes into detail about Bray Road and the stories that people have sent to her and then she goes across the country for different Wolfman and Dogman stories across the country. And I, I think this is, I've read, I don't know, 80% of her books, I gotta say, and that's my, right. that's my favorite. But she gets a mineral point story that is a supernatural creature, but it's not a vampire. Hmm. In April 2004, a woman named Kim wrote me after finding my website and said she also knew of a werewolf sighting in Mineral Point. It happened in 1987, she said, about six years after the Pepper Vampire incident. But unlike that purported sighting, where only a known practical joker claimed to have seen the creature, the Chad Lewis talked about the gorilla suit. Right, right. Kim wrote that between 15 and 20 people saw this reputed werewolf. She didn't hint at the gathering's purpose. Um, the way the story goes, she wrote, is that it was on a spring day during the middle of the afternoon, sunny and everything, which is a time you don't expect a werewolf. But mm -hmm. it was the day before the full moon. A bunch of people, maybe 15 or 20, saw a werewolf running as it was changing, and then it went into a building and fell and clutched a railing and changed back into a human in front of everybody. There was a bunch of people that talked about it in the 80s. That's how the, Kim finished her email. Um, and Linda goes on to say that Kim does name more people's names who, she says, saw the werewolf with her. And um, Linda tried to track him down, actually. And uh, unfortunately, he claimed to have no memory of the incident. And another person named Kim that she looked for turned out to be deceased. So Linda said that uh, her investigation ended there. But once again, um, it's I mean, it's not just it. It's the claim of a beast. Harry, scary. Right. That's you know, crazy. But, and so. And, so this enough, is proven to us beyond a shadow way. of a doubt, Mike, that. Uh, we should all avoid Wisconsin at all costs. I was going to say the drift, the driftless region <laughs> is a scary place. Um, but you know, it eventually when the gold rush happened, a lot of the Cornish miners left. And now these are, are, are tiny towns quaint and they're very historic and beautiful. Um, but what's really interesting is that uh, Ridgeway has kept like the, the phantoms on the water tower, you know, <laughs> it's like mm -hmm. they, you know, they've made it into part of um, the history of the town and um, embracing it. Yeah, and th and that's made it that's made it kind of fun. Um, that's crazy. Even though he is a murderer, like so, it's well, like <laughs> we've got wolf werewolf creatures in the woods. We've got vampire creatures chasing us down. We're going to be talking to Jack in a few minutes about large flying beasts over the skies of Chicago. At least our waterways are safe, Mike. <laughs> At least there's nothing we have to be concerned about. In well, water, that depends. That that's unless you're um, in Lake Mendota or Monona. 
near Wisconsin um, because we certainly uh, here, uh, I'm about two blocks from Lake Monona here, so I'm going to keep my voice down. Um, no, but uh, as far as um, the lake monsters here, uh, if you're out in the water, uh, it may not just be the Mineral Point Vampire at Ludden Lake that'll get you. Um, also, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, um, there was lots of reports of people seeing sea serpents. Um, I mean, I guess lake serpents, see, you know, but right. the lakes are big, yeah. not that big. But I've seen lake monsters, you know, right here in Wisconsin and particularly in this area. And, you know, people were describing it as a creature. Some, at first, it started maybe 10 or 12 feet long with the head of a dogfish. And, it, and you know, dogfish does have kind of that, I'm, I'm doing a little thing here, like the sea serpent or whatever, but you know, <laughs> right. a, dog, a dogfish does kind of have that look um, right. that we normally associate with um, the Loch Ness Monster. And, you know, in, in Madison here, they even gave the, the monster its own name, uh, Bajo which is kind of a, um, a very bougie of them. <laughs> right. Well, Bajo. you know, and it, and that comes from an Indian word. Oh, gotcha. You know, Winnebajo, who's a, a great character in the creation of the world in some of the, um, the Indian tribes here, the, the whole chunk of the Potawatomi and, and their legends. And so they kind of, they, they, they take that um, name and they start, it kind of becomes like a university of Wisconsin, almost unofficial mascot in the early 20th century, because like really? all the kids are talking about it. And once again, Charles E. Brown, he goes in and he writes about the sea serpents of Wisconsin. And that's one of the pamphlets um, that he comes up with when he's working for the Wisconsin historical society. And my particular favorite story is that um, there's a place called picnic point here on the on university campus. And Picnic Point is on Lake Mendota, and it's a beautiful place to go to. It's where people, you know, just go for walks and hikes, and it's where young students in love might go to canoodle. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> and it, it's and it's a perfect place uh, for a psycho with a hockey mask. If any psycho with, psychos with hockey masks are listening right now, they um, are big fans <laughs> of the show. That's that's great. Right. So you get two students sunbathing, and uh, while one of the girls is laying down, she feels a tickling at her feet. Now she thinks it's her friend being a little frisky or whatever, turns over and she says what looks like a dragon staring at her. And it was licking her foot. And she said she wasn't afraid because it seemed like it had kind eyes. <laughs> but, they, <laughs> but they still got up and ran away. Oh, um, wow. And, you know, and the, the stories are in the local newspapers. They're, they're quoting people saying, like, I'm not going to go on the lake unless I'm, you know, one guy says he, he sees the monster and he says, I'm not going to return uh, without uh, two Winchesters and a loaded rifle. Um, Dean and Sam Winchester. Are those the two Winchesters he's talking <laughs> that's, about? Well, that's probably what he's thinking now. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, you know, and. And so there's all these stories about, uh, you know, going from like the mid 1880s to the 1920s of, of sightings of the lake. Now, it doesn't seem like there has been any um, lake sightings since the uh, early 1940s, or at least ones that have made the paper. Um, but the idea that this area around the lakes, particularly in Madison, is some kind of, well, some kind of special space um, where people might be seeing things. Um, it's definitely a sacred space because um, all around the lake are the uh, the effigy mounds, the um, Indian Indian mounds built in the shape of something, you know, could be a bird, could be a dog. There's um, there's a lizard mound a block and a half away from me right now that's right on the edge of the lake. Um, Madison, in particular, had the, like the most, con and Dane County, where we're in, had the most concentrated number of these effigy mounds. Wow. Um, anywhere in the you know in the world and so um they uh, when they built the university and built to the town they're not even you know these in the in the 19th century these guys weren't culturally sensitive to you know the indians beliefs and uh what's sacred you know so and they're not all graveyards sometimes they're just sacred mounds like a lot of the mounds don't have dead bodies in them or anything but they are i mean they were created to be um a sacred space and especially right. the people who live there and so 
you know, right on Bascom Hill, which is where the, the main university um, of Wisconsin is, uh, that, I mean, they just built through it, like <laughs> right through the mound, tore it up, and they've done that. Now, once again, Charles E. Brown, he's the guy who kind of led the charge to save what mounds were left um, in Wisconsin. And it, yeah, and so uh, he's he's the guy that says, like, here's all this folklore I've collected and, and he's saving the Indian stories and he's, um, you know, bringing them uh, to the Wisconsin historical society. So, so people can have an understanding of it. And right. so um, these, you know, sacred spaces and special places seem to be a play and they don't seem to be where um, people have, you know, these kind of sightings, whether you're talking about different kinds of paranormal events handling on these, you know, these old roads, um, and or lakes like here uh, that are surrounded by um, sacred spaces. Uh, people sure. like at the end of the 19th century, it's um, lake monsters because that's something that's kind of in the public's imagination. Um, if you're talking about the you know Ridgeway Phantom and the Mineral Point Vampire and things that people saw also at the time, that's Spring Heel Jack. That's in their imagination. People are having some kind of experience they can't explain, and then they're putting Projecting something it almost right you know they're they're putting what they can explain on it you know we, we even talk about that with with ufos now like we believe in a like it seems plausible to believe in aliens and so the idea you see a flying saucer well it's an extraterrestrial 200 years ago that had been an angel 2000 years ago that would have right. been a fairy it's all um, in the perceptions of the day and the time yeah i've got to wrap up mike i appreciate this how can people keep up with your research your band and uh, where they can see you next Oh, absolutely. So um, you can hear a lot of this research um, at AmericanGhostWalks.com. We do new articles every week. Um, and it's also we do haunted history tours in six different states and Puerto Rico. Uh, so you can find that at AmericanGhostWalks.com. And uh, if you're interested in learning about the ghostly stuff, and if you're interested in music uh, with a side of paranormal along to it, uh, you can find our band Sunspot at SunspotUniverse.com. And we're going to be featuring... A sunspot song here and there throughout our show as we continue to introduce songs on friday nights so make sure you tune in and you'll get to hear one of their uh, paranormal themed songs mike thanks for popping in it's always great catching up with you thanks for spending time today dave and, and let me pontificate on the mineral point <laughs> i love it buddy take care listen we've talked werewolves we've talked vampires and lake creatures and phantoms i'm from the chicagoland area and I have been fascinated by this spate of strange creature sightings that have been taking place. This, they don't know. I, some are indicating that it's a mothman like creature, some saying it's a huge bat like creature. And I needed to know more about this. So that is our next guest. Jack, is it Chavez? Am I saying that properly? Uh, yeah, yes, you are. All right, great. Jack, well, thank you for being here with us. You've been keeping up with this case and these strange sightings. Yeah. What's going on with this? Yeah, um, well, thanks for having me um, here. You know, it's a, it's, it's a privilege. I'm a, I'm a big fan. But um, so I started out um, investigating the Mothman sightings. If I get you to, to lower your mic just a little bit, you're coming in really hot on us. All right, go ahead. And now we've lost your mic altogether. So I guess you've got to be right in that sweet spot to keep the audio clip, huh? How about this? That's fine. All right. So you've been, okay. you've been monitoring these uh, Mothman bat-like creature sightings. What's going on? Yeah, I started out in uh, 2017 um, when the sightings began. Um, well, technically, you know, you could say that they started in Chicago Chicagoland area. In uh, 2011, there was a sighting on Pulaski and 63rd Street. A photographer took a photo um, that looked like a like an eerie uh, flying humanoid. And then afterwards, uh, fast forward to 2017, you got a spat of sightings, um, and it ju they just kept coming. So one of them took place in April of 2017. Uh, it was in the Pilsen neighborhood, and during this time, I was living in Pilsen. So I read the article, 
And I was like, well, I want to know who the heck is investigating, you know, um, because at the end of the article, it says, you know, um, investigators are, you know, stay tuned. Investigators will, will, you know, get back to you. We're losing your audio again. There you go. Can't hear me? No, I got you. Don't move. We've got you. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Okay, So, um, it so looks looking like it who's looks researching like, this and, and who's right. looking into these cases, what the legitimacy of them are. So one organization that I found that was looking into it was MUFON, Mutual UFO Network. And right. it's the uh, country's largest UFO organization. And uh, so I contacted, uh, I said, well, who, I wasn't familiar with MUFON, which is, I should have been because I was investigating UFOs at the time, but I wasn't really familiar with them. So I said, okay, I, I was going to assume since they're a nationwide organization that they are broken up into chapters. And sure enough, they are, they're, it's state by state. So the Illinois State Director of MUFON is Sam Maranto. And he, um, so I found his contact information online and I I called him and I said, you know, hey, my name is Jack Chavez. This is what I do. I'm a paranormal researcher. And we started talking about the sightings. And basically he said, you know, that sighting that you read about, we got that one sighting that came in but the rest of them are not coming into MUFON. They're coming into, uh, you know, another website. And then so we, you know, Sam and I really hit it off. And uh, we actually became colleagues and, and friends since then. Mm-hmm. But, you know, these sightings, uh, they, they kept coming. And it looks like they were coming into a, um, a blog called Phantoms and Monsters, uh, run by Lon Strickler. And... Uh, I did contact Lon, and he asked me if I had any, you know, personal reports. And I said no, but you know, I would like to, you know, help you out as much as I can. I'm a paranormal researcher, and um, you know, he said, yeah, okay, you know, you know, we'll see and stuff. Um, I was able. There was a sighting at the Sears Tower in Chicago, and I was able to kind of track down the witness. By okay. using context clues in the in the article, uh, in the report, so using context clues, I was able to figure that okay, he kind of works here. I could go here and see if he does work there. And long story short, I did, and I met up with him, and I, you know, we exchanged information, um, and basically for that sighting, he said that a he thought he was witnessing somebody commit suicide, but then their uh, wings spread and they morphed from a bird-like entity into an insect-like entity and then kind of just flew away. So obviously I was very intrigued by this. And this is like one of the most cited uh, sightings. Um, However, you know, when I tried to uh, reach out to him uh, again. You know, he was really vague about it. <laughs> Excuse me, he was really vague about it and stuff. And uh, eventually, it came out that uh, he didn't see what he said he saw. Um, it seemed like it was. Uh, it seemed like it was a hoax. A bandwagon so, jumper. Somebody that was trying to get in on this kind of weird history that was beginning to propagate around the area. Yeah, so that was disappointing. Um, and there's a whole story of how I found that out, but I mean, the details are, you know, pretty bland. But yeah, I did find that out. <clears throat> so that was disappointing. Um, now, one of the other sightings was in the Logan Square neighborhood in Chicago. And it was a a bouncer at a bar. He... Um, cited what he described was a pterodactyl-like creature. Right. So, again, I used context clues. I went to the bar. I found a witness. And I was really excited. 
And then I said, you know, can I talk to you about this? And I go, there, there's no witnesses, you know, on camera. I would really like to talk to you about it. And he goes, oh, sure, we could talk for like five minutes. I said, okay, that's fine. So, um, yeah, he said that he was on a cigarette break outside. And overhead, he saw this creature that he could only describe as a pterodactyl-like being uh, flying overhead. And so in my, because I'm technologically deficient, deficient I, uh, I, I had like an iPod and I recorded our interview there, but it was like really dark. The audio was horrible, but I was like, okay, like, okay, whatever. At least I got something, you know, on camera that I could, I could say that I did. Right. So, um, but he was really cool. Um, his name is John. And he actually went on about, I think, like six months later to be interviewed by Vice Magazine. And um, I think a couple TV networks um, contacted him too, mm -hmm. but I don't think anything happened after that. Um, so what do, you, so, what do you make of these sightings? Are is there something really happening over the skies of the Chicago and Chicago uh, land area, or or does this seem to be an urban legend that's spreading? People adding themselves to the mix and wanting to gain their fifteen minutes of fame. You know, it really seems like there's an urban legend that's taking place. Uh, I will say I do believe John. John was a really sweet guy, um, came across as really sincere. But we don't know any of the other witnesses. We don't have um, names for them. We don't have them on camera. Um, we yeah, don't have any recordings for them. And then you've got, you've got <coughs> different investigators that are trying to uh, look into these cases, examine them, but they don't want to share their information or findings. They want to keep that kind of to themselves. Exactly. So it, it just makes things difficult. I think by the end right. of 2017, we had, I, if I'm correct, I believe we had about 67 sightings and, and nobody on camera. Um, so it's just, you know, it well, just you makes think you that think that has like, to do with people or people are embarrassed to, you know, I don't know. I want to go on camera. I'll talk to my buddies about it. And we'll share the information, but I don't want to be seen. People are going to look at me like I'm nuts if I talk about this. But that many, that many yeah, witnesses not willing to be on camera. Um, absolutely. Um, uh, witness, you know, protection is uh, pertinent when you're in the paranormal. It's very important. If a witness wants to remain anonymous, you know, it, it, it is your job to make sure that they are anonymous. But when you have, at the end of 2017, 67 witnesses, and then far more after that, right. who all say they don't want to be on camera, who all say they say they don't want their name said out loud, it's, it's, um, it, it's just suspicious, you know? What do you so, uh, what do you make of this new uh, sighting that just took place last month? I think it was a FedEx driver who saw it in this parking mm -hmm. area and this thing bounding about. Um, that seems legit. There was a name given and information, and it was part of an actual uh, article. Is that something yeah. that you've had a chance to sit down and talk with or get on camera? No, I, I haven't had the chance for that, and I, I would love to. Um, it's hard. Con it's hard contacting any other witness when like there's investigators that wants to you know keep it keep it kind of Clamp to themselves. Their story. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's not hard to to go go forward from there. It's it's really been frustrating actually. So I bet. Well, thank you for the insights on this, Jack, giving us a little uh, intel that there, there may be a nugget of truth behind this, but it seems as though maybe more people have added to this mix and maybe even some of the investigators are allowing legend to be more than factual and, and I definitely think people. I definitely think there is a nugget of truth. Um, the uh, Bob Anderson, who hosts the paranormal podcast, Bob After Dark, uh, we had a sit down and talk and he's witnessed something um, a flying humanoid as well. Um, and, you know, Bob is really sincere. Um, he, he's even kind of a little skeptical. So when he tells me something, I totally believe it. Was it Mothman? Honestly, I don't know. Um, but he saw something. So there's, there definitely is strange phenomena taking place in the Midwest. 
You know, the one thing I will say is, right, Mothman is associated with showing up before tragedies. And in Chicago, there has been, from my understanding, uh, from the news that have been, you know, been reported out there, there's been a lot of tragedy, a lot of deaths and violence. It seems to be on a massive up, uptick. So maybe yeah. there is something to this harbinger of death. Well, I mean, that's a possibility, but honestly, Chicago has been crime-ridden far before Mothman appeared. <laughs> right. No, I, I understand that. It just seems to me, again, I grew up in that area. I had relatives sure. that lived downtown by Levitt, and and I, I spent summers, and I saw shootings and heard shootings take place, so I know that. But it just seems yeah. the way they're reporting it now, it's become even more deadly. So I don't know. Very yeah, strange. The, the downtown area of Chicago has uh, recently been... Um, a lot, a lot more crime than usual has been taking place. Uh, so there's, yeah. there's that. Yeah. Well, Jack, thank you so much for stopping in and spending some time. Yeah, absolutely. Here. Thank you. I appreciate it. Strange creatures and coming from that area. Very, very strange. I, I will tell you one quick story, personal story, folks, before we go out from the Chicago land area. And I probably should have asked Mike or Jack when I had them on, because I can never remember the area, but it's this, like a forest preserve that is um, also a burial ground for some natives. And they have a headstone there denoting who is buried. And uh, my buddy and I had gone there with a couple of girls. And, uh, you know, this was uh, when I was divorced and we were talking to these girls and he was trying to make, make away with them by showing off his paranormal buddy. And we went into this uh, place at night when you're not supposed to be there. And we're walking through, and this is near Chicago land area. I want to even say it's it's close to maybe Midlothian. Um, we're walking around in there and uh, just kind of talking about the ghost stories of this location. And, and uh, suddenly this wailing noise, like a banshee, like a siren noise, just starts screaming inside this wooded area and then it de-evolves from this scream this into what sounds like a cacophony of dogs wild dogs coyotes wolves whatever and you could hear the crunching of of leaves and sticks as this band of predators are approaching us and we did the only thing we could do we both reached down and grabbed big sticks and kind of went back to back and we started backing our way out of there and it was it was terrifying you're hearing all these dogs barking and things coming through the woods and i'm like we're gonna leave we're out of here just stop we'll we'll leave and like that it stopped not a sound and we put the sticks down and we backed out of there quick, got into our car and that was it. So had we disturbed the spirits, the spirit realm, the protectors of this native indigenous burial area? I'm not sure, but there are strange things around us, folks. And that's what we talk about on the show. Strange things with amazing guests and stories just like that. Monsters, myths, and legends spring up all around us. When's the last time you Googled your hometown for the mysteries that have been around you your whole life? You may be surprised to see what untold legends are closer than you think. I'd like to thank my guests tonight, Eric Mintel, Mike Huberty, and Jack Chavez, for keeping us uh, alert and our minds aware of the fact that there are things that are around us. And thank you all for visiting the Paranormal 60 and allowing me on your journey. May the darkness be a little more light with the information that we shared here. Make sure to like this video. Do me a favor. Please like the video, like the podcast, however you're doing it, rate and review it, share it, get the word out about the Paranormal 60, let people know where we are and how you can find us every Monday and Friday night. We would deeply appreciate that. And remember, if you'd like to be featured on an upcoming episode and join me and the news crew and share your stories, all you have to do is email me, dave at paranormal60.com. That's dave at paranormal60.com. And uh, I will give you a link for an upcoming Friday episode. You can join in and share your story. So I hope that you'll consider doing that and spending some more time with us here. Thank you for tuning in. This is the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. <laughs>